Hello, welcome to Manny Beal. I'm heading back into part three, or back into this, and this is part three of my um, dealing with the major criticisms of Bernardo Castro's ontology slash metaphysics. And um, no big changes since the last one, still the same, same criticisms on my list over there, right? To the left. Uh, but let's get back into absolute philosophy's criticism and see if uh, there's something, or let me see if I can find something that is useful and valid uh, criticism that I haven't spotted yet. Um, and it's not unlikely that he has found something that I, I haven't seen or, you know, put put things together, right? And it's it that it is also, you know, Listening to somebody else's philosophy is generally, it is, it's the words are cheap thing, right? Throwing up, up some words and say, I've done some philosophy is kind of cheap, right? If you're not, if you don't appeal to this, okay, I have to be very rigid about it. I have to say, I'm starting with this. I'm start and going from this to this, and then going from this to this, and so on and so on and so on. Otherwise, it is just a sort of buffet of philosophy where you can possibly get away with cherry picking whatever thing you want to use as your argument at this particular step in your philosophy, right? Where I like things to, you know, okay, what what is the starting point? Okay, at the starting point, I cannot use anything I'm going to have to establish later because that later thing is based on the starting point and so on. This kind of structure is, in my opinion, everything in philosophy. It's not everything. But if you don't have that, you basically don't have a philosophy, in my opinion. You just have a lot of fancy words that you're throwing up in the air and you're just cherry-picking whatever you want to piecing together a puzzle that looks like a philosophy. I mean, if you if if you have cre think you have created the perfect philosophy out of that approach, it would be absolutely pure chance. And it's not trustworthy because what is the what is the algorithm? What is the procedure? What is the method you're following in order to ensure that you're actually doing good philosophy? That's why I am sort of more or less heading towards some kind of meta-philosophy, which is actually thinking, okay, not only what am I doing when I'm doing philosophy, but how am I going to do it, right? Maybe there needs to be invented a whole new category of thinking, which is, what is the method of philosophy? What is the structure? What follows from what? And so on. I, I can't remember anybody in my... 10 plus years of listening to philosophy and also doing my own philosophy, but I'm, I'm tending to go towards this kind of structure. I have never seen anybody appeal to, yes, you have to get to a particular structure. This is my structure. This is my method. No, they just start shouting words at you, right? It's, they just... It's sort of a tsunami of words. And when we sort of try to scrutinize them, say, okay, fair enough, you have some philosophy there, interesting. Let me have your definition of this, or what follows from that, and why? what enables you to say this and that? And then they get all up in arms, how dare you ask questions to me? I'm a philosopher. I have at least five PhDs. You are not allowed to ask questions, sort of. Maybe I'm <laughs> hyperbole a bit there, right? But... It seems, you know, in every other avenue of life, let me put it that way, I cannot start my car before I turn the key in the ignition, right? I cannot say, the car started, now I'm going to ignite it. Well, I can say it, and that's the problem with philosophy, but I can't do it, right? I need to turn the key in the ignition before the engine starts, right? And this it's just these simple things 
if everything in my everyday is structured in this way, why the hell wouldn't the philosophy that's supposed to be the thinking behind it all, why wouldn't that be structured also, right? I'm not saying that's, that's an argument and such, but why would my everyday be structured in this kind of causal, or causal manner, you could say, right? But any kind of thinking would just be cherry-picking whatever you want. I'm, I'm not buying it, right? And it's not a particular criticism of absolute philosophy here, right? Absolute philosophy. It's, just, it's also that, okay, I know, you know, you have to have a title and it has to be sort of, oh my God, absolute philosophy, right? It's kind of pretentious, right? <laughs> um, and absolute, what does that even mean, right? Um, uh, well, never mind. It, it, I, I, I'm fine with, you know, finding critique points here and there. Okay, I think I found a flaw in your philosophy there. And I'm doing the same thing. But that's mainly for my own sake, right? Uh, and I'm latching very much onto Bernardo Castro and an analytic idealism because I see that as potentially, potentially one of the most dangerous movements in, in recent history that I have identified, right? Most of the other academics, uh, thankfully, they sit and hide in the ivory tower and don't stick out their neck, right? Because they're not allowed to, basically. Otherwise, they might lose their, the gravy train they're sitting on, right? If they stick out their neck, they, it might get chopped off and they say, hey, hey you, you can't be a part of academia anymore. Out with you, right? So they have to, you know, brown nosing and, and ass licking uh, their masters in the academic tax funded ivory tower business, right? So that's, you know, it stays within in the in the ivory tower. They 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 are they are circle jerking each other in there, and and they they don't influence the greater. Uh, the greater mainstream thinking of humanity, so to say, to be a little, you know, grandiose about it, right? But you know what I mean. That's why that when, when somebody then does that, like Bernardo Castro and Analytic Idealism and Essential the Foundation, they are kind of, they are roaming free, so to say. There, there, there is not much competition there, right? And that's why I think it's very important to do the work I, I'm doing here. At least it's important for me, scrutinizing what the hell they're doing, right? Because if they're coming up with book titles like the recent uh, or the next one that Bernardo uh, dude is is going to uh, publish, which is something like I paraphrasing the title, but analytic idealism, the the only functional ontology metaphysics for the 21st century uh, perfect philosophy, right? It's like, okay, okay, I have to scrutinize that, right? Show me somebody else who, who, who is that bold about their, their, their shit, right? You can't find much if, if any other, right? And, you know, a lot of people uh, recently have attacked me. Why, why are you so hung up about... Bernardo, you're just angry because he's better than you, and something like that. This pathetic, childish. It's sort of when when the congregation of his followers they say, "There's somebody attacking my priest. I have to get rid of him. I have to attack him. He's he's probably a weirdo, or you know, whatever." Not. What I'm concerned about is the philosophy, right? I'm trying to get rid of all the, 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 the personality or, or any kind of, you know, all that shit. I want to get to the philosophy. I want all these critique points are things I don't find to be well argued. <clears throat> and if he's going to tell me about this fantastic philosophy that is going to revolutionize the 21st century, whatever, right? I would fucking very much like this to be clarified, right? And if it's not clarified, I would like to 
warn other individuals about this might not be a very good philosophy after all, even if these people believe it, right? You know, the world is run by, as I said before, psychopaths, crazy people and useful idiots, right? So whenever somebody says something bold like, this is the philosophy of the next hundred years, I've come up with it and it's perfect. It's the only thing and you need to follow this basically, right? I'm like, okay, which one is it? Is it psycho? Is it, uh, is it craziness? Or is it just some useful idiot being, you know, Pinocchio uh, strings, right? Puppet masters. Uh, what, is, what is going on here, right? Nobody in the right mind would say anything like this. The, my, the, 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 the preve prevalent, prevailing mainstream metaphysics is flawed, which I agreed upon, right? Therefore, my is per mine is perfect. I come up with it. And it's the only thing that is functional for the next hundred years, at least. Uh, you, 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 you have to be, you have to be suffering for, from some kind of megalomania. I think it's what called back in the day, right? But you know, there, there are more modern terms, I believe, for this, right? Some kind of social uh, deviant kind of uh, there's something mentally you have some extreme ideas about your own magnificence right it's not it's not a sign of humility right and What is usually going on is somebody says, I have a fantastic idea. I have come up with communism, right? And it might sound nice on the paper, right? Everybody gets what they want from what they need. And you know, oh my God, we're taking care of everybody. Everybody will have work and all. Everybody, yeah. And after a hundred years of trying it on for size, there's a pile of corpses up to the sky, right? Of people who didn't actually, you know, they were just, get it gotten rid of right whenever somebody comes up with this is how it works i am like okay hang on right i need to scrutinize this right because it's going to it's it's like the as i pointed out the the metaphor of of the the ring of power in in uh, the lord of the rings right with gandalf there who sort of He's the philosopher, right? It's the, he's the philosopher who's trying to understand how things work. If he had come up with the idea, I just need to grab this ring and everybody has to follow me because I, you know, right? Then, as he says, he, do, he dare not do it because through him, he would try, he will be convinced that he's doing something good. But through him, it would wield the power too terrible to imagine because all the crazy people, all the psychopaths, and all these people are going to twist it around to their advantage and use it against everybody else, right? All these revolutionaries out there, they're usually not those who end up being the one running the shit show after a few years of revolution, right? Like in, in 1917 in Russia. The first ones were kicked out, and then the next iteration and the third iteration. I'm not even into that story there, right? But and and ended up with Stalin, who was a fucking crazy psycho, man, right? It wasn't exactly the idea, but they will take over, and new a new iteration will take over and take over, right? And piles of dead people will be there, right? Words are fucking cheap, right? And words are dangerous. This is explosive as fuck, right? So, better safe than sorry, right? Okay, after that rant, let me head into... And it's not particular, I'm not going... I mean, I'm using absolute philosophy here as, as, an, in, uh, as an inspiration. I'm not criticizing his video as such, right? In not, not in the rant I just did. But 
you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm reacting to some of it, but, but he said, I'm using his as inspiration in order to get to a perfect list of major criticisms of, of Bernardo Castro, right? <clears throat> If I can go get it started. Objects that make it up. And you'd need to adopt the realist attitude if you wanted to use things like entropy or evolutionary theory to prove that our perceptions are a simplification like Kastrup's dashboard. But as soon as Kastrup has used the arguments in... Yeah, but maybe it's the problem of if there's an if there's a world outside. First, you need to clarify how that world outside somehow influences. Or at least you need to deal with the idea of, does it really, if there's a world outside, is there some connection between my inner world and that outside world? And what connection does it have? And how do I, do I get to that connection? Because I'm talking about an imagined external world that I don't have access to then, right? So we are dealing with something that is very, very difficult to handle without going into, I'm just going with this because I want it, right? It's just around the corner. Bias and, and, and uh, cherry picking and circular reasoning, it's everywhere in this kind of thinking. You have to be very, very careful, right? And then if, if you say, okay, but I think there's an external world and some part of my experience or my phenomena are representation of that external world, then if they're representations or I'm using the term representation, right? But you, are, you, you cannot argue for them being representations. You can only decide them to be axiomatically, in my opinion, right? You have to say very clearly, I cannot argue because I don't know if there's something out there. And if there's, I decide there's something out there, I can't get to what it is. So I can't get to any connection with my phenomena to say whether the, there is some kind of direct or indirect, whatever, right? But to deal with the problem of an external world, you have to settle on something. And how you settle on that is ex of extreme importance that you are not saying more than you are allowed, allowed to say, so to say, in a meta-philosophical manner, right? You can't just... You can't just throw words at me under the pretense of this is being an argument for whatever is in an external world. In my opinion, if you are dealing with an external world, it can only be axiomatically, which is my way of saying, I am deciding to do it. I am deciding to treat this as that or imagine this and basing that on that. In, by, and by saying axiom, I am saying I am deciding to do it. I'm very clear that I cannot argue for it, right? If you think you can argue for it, let me hear your argument. But I have never heard any good argument for this. And if you want to deal with this aspect, you have to do it axiomatically, in my opinion. <clears throat> so if we were fabulating about an external world, and even if I decided to say, I will treat this particular kind of phenomena or category of phenomena as representation of an external world. That external world was created by me, by imagination, by axiom. So I don't even know if it's there. I'm just working from the idea of it, right? That doesn't mean, as because I decided to do it axiomatically, that all of a sudden that external world appeared. And now I have to clarify this, that and the other out there, right? I don't think that's good thinking. You are not allowed to imagine something and then go and say, it's like saying, I imagine there's a Middle Earth, so now I have to go and invent hobbits and, and this, that, and the other, right? It's, it's, it's imagination based on imagination. That is not good philosophy, in my opinion, right? So, it is, I think he is on the right track here, absolute philosophy, that it is an appeal to being able to argument on top of an imagination. It's an imagination of what is out there and how it's supposed to be understood in its complexity and whatever, right? <clears throat> but if I had to bet personally, 
if I somehow had to bet my money on if there was a world out there and if there were representations, I would bet my money on that my represent whatever it is out there is vastly different. Vastly different is even possibly an understatement, right? It is, as Bernardo Castro says, a different paradigm. And because I don't have access to it, and I would personally consider it a completely different paradigm, I am so unbelievably shut off from it that that I I'm hesitate to call him, or you know, I'm almost calling Bernardo Castro a fucking crazy mystic for then deciding to go and tell me how he sees it working, how he understands it to be working, right? He's basically saying, what I have is completely different. And what I have is the only thing I have. But for some reason, I've come up with the idea of an external world. Now I'm going to tell you something about how it works. That's crazy, right? That's crazy talk. He's basically starting out saying, I am completely shut off. I don't even know if there's an external world. He doesn't say that, but he should be, right? He is basically implying it by stating that this dashboard of his is in a different paradigm that some external world he hasn't scrutinized, right? So in any standard, he's shut off from it, right? There is no way of comparing whatever it is you're experiencing to something else. There's no way of doing it, right? So it's, if you jump into this, I have to fabulate about an external world, you will be forever trying to imagine something you cannot imagine, right? You can, you, can, you can go to the limits of your own access and then no further, right? You can, you can maybe say there is, it stops here and I'm going to, I mean, in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of metaphorical sense, right? My phenomena ends here. I can't go any further, right? But can I say anything about whether or not there is or isn't something beyond my own phenomena? No. Therefore, I can neither claim that there is something beyond or claim that there isn't something beyond, right? So you're, you're in this scenario where you, you can't say either or. Basically, you, you have to say knowledge is impossible. I can't go there, right? But because I go, go, there, go there, I can neither say it isn't or it is. So how do I approach that? That's the question, in my opinion, right? It's not whether or not it's more complicated or less complicated than my experiences, because that implies that you are working from the idea of an external world. You have to settle that external world before you start to and be, be humble about it. Just because you establish something in an imagination doesn't mean you all of a sudden can create an ontology of what is going on there, right? Okay. In scientific literature to show that the dashboard is a simplification, he then suddenly switches to an anti-realist view of science. Anti-realists think that scientific theories don't tell you about how the world really is. Instead, they say that the theories are just useful tools for predicting what happens when we experience it. And it's the anti-realist view that Kastrup needs to say that the theories of science just tell you about how dials on the dashboard relate to each other. And it's only by doing this that he's able to claim that the dashboard is itself the physical world. Castro wants to say that these scientific realists are wrong. Uh, uh, careful. The physical world. Uh, be careful, we are not mixing up meanings here, right? What we use when you grow up as a materialist, physicalist, that's which I believe is the default setting of human beings, right? That's why it's usually so hard to get over the hurdle of rejecting the physicalist notion of thinking that your experiences is outside your experiences, right? 
what everybody re- claiming, in my opinion, talking about when they're talking about physics and chemistry and so on, is that which Bernardo Castro calls his dashboard, right? I don't particularly like the term dashboard, but let's stay with that anyway, right? That's all he, all the phenomena he has is basically his dashboard, right? There might be some, he calls meta consciousness, which is sort of emotions and, and the awareness of the, what is going on and so on. What is it like? And I'm not, I don't like all these various ideas of consciousnesses and so on, right? That, I mean, it has to be, you have to be sure that you don't just invent shit in order to explain shit, right? But the physics is how these colors and cognitions and shit, they move about in that phenomenal thing you have, right? Because that's what, that's what empiricism is, right? It's, it's a direct experience. And that's what the, the scientific method is, is praised for. It is it's using empiricism. And that is that dashboard you're using. So it's obvious that, as I mean, it's quite simple. That's the, it, it's not, a, it's like, because physicalists call that thing that what they are, that dashboard is out beyond themselves, right? They call that physics and the physical world. So when he says what you're actually talking about is their own particular, their own experience, maybe combined with some uh, imagined understanding of a reality, that they sort of projected outside themselves, so they sort of get mixed up in what are we actually talking about when we're talking about the physical world. Well, if there's an external world, but you're retracting from naive realism, then whatever you're talking about as physics must be the dashboard then, right? You just have to be careful that you follow the steps of reasoning and not think that he's talking about that there is a world out there, but it's not physical. No, it's not physical in the sense of physics. Physics is the how these dials, as he calls them, moves about, right? Of course. That's why science and physics and chemistry and these things, they don't go away just because you are retracting or pointing out the, the, the ridiculousness of physicalism or the physicalist uh, metaphysics, right? You're just saying... I am talking about how my particular subjective experience moves about, right? That's what I'm doing science with. So, I, I don't know if that's clear, right? But at least that's my take on it. And that the real world doesn't consist of things like particles and matter whizzing well, around. Again, that's this, the real world. What is that? How, when and how did you get to it? The real world? So it's it's always this there's something outside myself that is more real than my my experience. My experience is secondary to that actual real objective unchanging world out there. How the hell do they get to this world? I just want to know because in any fashion that I can understand it it is habitual thinking. It is not accurate, right? Please give me the argument for that real world. How did you get to it? Right? Instead, he wants to argue that it's constituted by mind. So this brings me finally to my big concern with Castrop's method that, that, of that, argu- that was a bit simplistic, I think. Constituted of mind. Yeah, he wants to argue, but that's the problem. He has cherry-picked the idea of mind, and then he's going to add some arguments on top of it in order to qualify it. But that's a scientific approach to things. Coming up with a theory, and now I'm going to throw science at it, right? That's not philosophy. It's invalid thinking, uh, as I pointed out in this um, appeal to science and settling ontology. You can't do that. It's circular. You need your ontology to do science. So you can't use science to do your ontology, right? It's this, it, you know, you can very quickly, it would be my contention, 
you can invalidate basically all attempts at metaphysics and ontology purely from identifying circular reasoning. It is everywhere in this, right? And, you know, appeals to change in semantics and all these kinds of fallacies, right? There are fallacies as far as the eye can see in all this shit, right? And I'm not even going to claim that I'm free of any circular reasoning. And if you identify anything in my ontology or any, any part of my philosophy, for that matter, that I presented, please let me know, right? Because I would like to know if there's something uh, circular, right? So. Argument. He regularly argues for analytic idealism by drawing on arguments he's found in the scientific literature. But he rejects the scientific paradigm that they rely on. This seems to me like a case of Castro. I am not so sure about that. He doesn't reject. Yes, I mean, the, the reason you're following is something like this. Those who are doing science tend to be physicalists in a metaphysical sense, right? There's a difference between physics and physicalism, right? Physicalism is a metaphysics. It's a claim about an external world. Physics is describing, using a scientific method, about how your, uh, what I would call, uh, cognitions move about. And the quality of them and comparisons between them and so on. As Bernardo Kastrup says, com you know, uh, comparing that dial with that dial, and when that dial is at 11, that dial is usually at 5, and so on, right? That's not physicalism. Physicalism see, is saying, those dials are actually outside my cockpit, right? There are dials out there, right? Bernardo Castro says, that's, that's stupid, right? And I agree that's stupid, because it is stupid. If, if I'm experiencing elephant, I'm saying that elephant is out there, beyond my experiences. Well, it can't be, because I'm experiencing. They must be in here then, right? It's the hand outside the brain paradox, right? But because scientists usually, I would think, are physicalists, doesn't mean there's a problem in using science or uh, that he is trying to invalidate science based on a bad metaphysics. Because if you're retracting into a subjective stance about scientific method, it's still the same method. It's still the same science. The scientists, because of their physicalist approach, just claim more about it than they're allowed to. Right? That's the criticism of Bernardo Castro, I think, and I agree with that. Personally, I agree with that, right? So be careful you're not rejecting a metaphysics based on belief that somebody following this metaphysics are also doing science, and therefore their science is invalid because of Bernardo Castro having a different metaphysics, right? It's a little convoluted, this, but just be careful here to both have his cake and eat it. And I don't think that this method can ultimately work. Let's now look at Kastrup's analytic idealism. Using the terminology I've introduced, it's a kind of indirect idealism. There's the world of our perception, the dashboard, and then there's the real world outside or beyond it. The real world, Kastrup says, is nothing like the dashboard we can see but certain aspects and features of it are represented on the dashboard enough to allow us to survive. The real world beyond the dashboard, Kastrup says consists of universal consciousness, which is a field of pure mentation or mind. There is no matter, Kastrup thinks. There is only mind and the way mind appears. Castrop justifies... No, 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 but it, that is because, and, and that might be where, where Bernardo Castrop starts to, you know, dissolve a bit in his rigidity, right? Because he says, okay, I would have to say, and I would agree, that when you're talking about matter, you're actually talking about an abstraction from the cognitions on your dashboard. As I pointed out in my presentation about uh, science, 
it is if you take or the idea of matter, right? If you if you have the beaver, <laughs> it's a weird kind of um, metaphor or example, right? But if you have your beaver, right? And that's you. But you have your beaver, you walk up the Eiffel Tower and you look down on Earth, right? Then there's beaver, and that's you, but beaver, Eiffel Tower, and Earth, right? And then walk up Eiffel Tower, let go of beaver, beaver falls to Earth. Don't treat your beavers nice. This is a thought experiment, right? And if you, next day, well, I have no beaver, now I have a, a, a dog. You go up and you do the same thing with the dog, and you see some regularities. The dog behaved just like the beaver. Then you take your car keys off. Then you take a soft eyes off. Then you take a pizza off. Then you take your, you know, your mother-in-law off and try to do the same, right? And you do it with, you know, uh, your lamp and your, your, your movie collection. You, you do it with your, you know... Right, Barack Obama, and <laughs> you try everything, and they all do it the same way. They all move from their point on the Eiffel Tower to the same spot down on Earth. And there's the same time span. There's the same movement of the the path, the, the, the pathway they move. Then you might start to abstract and say, maybe there's something in common about these particular cognitions. Right? Maybe they are made of the same shit. And that is why they move, right? In this particular pattern. That's where the abstraction, the imagination of matter comes in. They are all made of the same shit. I'm going to call it matter. That doesn't mean you're experiencing matter. You imagined matter because of the behavior of these various types of cognitions under these particular same circumstances, right? That would be the only correct understanding of what it means to talk about matter, in my opinion. And I, I would presume that this is how the idea of matter occurred. It's because they behave the same way, these kind of objects. A carrot and a soft ice and a khaki does the same thing when you drop them from the Eiffel Tower. So I suppose they're made of the same shit. I call that matter, right? That doesn't mean you experience matter. And certainly you cannot necessarily say, well, then there must be matter out there then. What you can say, that my imagination of matter might have some existence in an external world beyond me. But I can't say, tell you what that is because I don't have access to it, right? But if I treat my experience as representation of an external world, there might be something out there that is responsible for what I imagine to be matter, right? But we are going very far out on a limb here because what that philosophy is based on an imagination called matter. And it has to stay with your dashboard, in my opinion. That is what Bernardo Castro talks about, right? Because that real world out there that you're talking about is completely undisclosed. Nobody has presented an argument for that external world, right? And that might be the reason why somebody like Immanuel Kant said, well, if there's an external world out there, I can't get to it, right? And maybe he should have said, well, maybe I can't get to it because I'm just imagining it. it's there, right? It's a kind of habitual thinking. So, how do you approach that, right? Because the, the, the standing, hard-nosed approach to philosophy is, I should be able to argue for it. I just have to think, 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 and I will come up with some kind of argument. Be that some kind of sophistry or manipulation or woo-woo shit. I don't care what it is. I have to find an argument. No. All you need to do is say, I am working from this axiom, Right? And if I state this as an axiom, it's an appeal to agreement or disagreement. If you can come up with an argument and convince me of the argument's validity of an external world, I will be more than happy to listen, right? I will be, I mean, I will raise you to, you know, uh, the level of Holy Grail, right? 
But until that happens, I have to work from an axiom. And if you claim to be able to argue in, a, some, in something that I would classify as a highly criticizable way of arguing for an external world, or even just pretending it without coming up with any clarification at all, be that an argument or an axiom or anything, just pretending that is there. Like, it seems like you're doing absolute philosophy and Bernardo Castro also, and everybody else I've heard, right? It doesn't matter who it is, whether they're idealist or they're materialist or whatever. It's only apparently solipsists. But they think that because they can't get to an external world, there is no external world. That is also bad thinking, right? Just because you can't get to it doesn't mean it isn't there. So... There are these basically three categories. There's the, the physicalists, the idealists, and the solipsists. And then there's me, right? <laughs> Who says, you're all idiots, man, right? None of your arguments hold. None of your arguments hold. You have to do better than this, right? Leaving that the real world consists of universal consciousness in two main ways. The first is that it solves what is commonly known as the hard problem of consciousness. This is the problem of explaining how consciousness could arise from something like matter that is not conscious. I'll come back to this idea. Okay, before we get into that, I'm actually kind of confused about how Bernardo Castro actually deals with this hard problem. I... I think he think he solved it, solved, quote, solved, right? Maybe that's not the best term to use. But because he says everything is mind, there is no problem. Because if you're experiencing a brain, that's a part of your dashboard. So you can't say, how does my dashboard arrive out of something within my dashboard? That's stupid, right? He says there must be something beyond the brain, which is the whatever is actually responsible for your experience of it, which you call brain. And that eventually becomes an experience of your dashboard, but you can't get to it. In my opinion, he would say it's some kind of ripple or something like, fuck that shit, right? But what hard problem dudes are trying, or dudesses are trying to solve is, how does the experience of my brain become my experience? It, it, it's completely madness, right? And the, the hard problem arrives because of that paradox I'm referring to with the hand, the experience of a hand outside my experience, right? That's why there is a hard problem. In my opinion, you can ask the question, you can present the problem, but you can't get to an answer, right? And maybe that's the whole idea of it. All these people dealing with a hard problem, they have work in infinity. They just have to convince people, yeah, 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 we might, we might find the solution at some point, but let's get, let's, let's get going with this professorship for another for 25 years. And I could go to conferences and say, yeah, we are, we are one small step closer to solving the hard problem. It's never going to be solved because you can't get to the, pro to the solution, right? It's beyond your experiences, obviously, right? So... <laughs> yeah, a little bit more soon. Second, Castro argues that analytic idealism can explain various facts about consciousness and the physical world in a natural and simple way, so that it's the best explanation for many of our scientific discoveries. With analytic idealism justified, Castro then tells a creation story about us and the physical world. Once upon a time, Oh, yeah. Everything that oh, there was. Oh, my God, right? Oh, shit. Sorry about it. I, uh, I clicked on the next video button. I shouldn't do that. So we have to get back into this. Sorry about that. I hate when that happens, right? <laughs> oh wanted to use things like entropy or evolutionary theory to prove that our perceptions are simply if i can how far did we get i don't remember exactly
Yeah, I think it's here. Explaining analytic idealism. Let's take it from here. Let's see how it goes. I don't want to waste your time. Once upon a time, everything that there was in the whole of existence... It's just once upon a time, right? If there's any kind of statement I would avoid at all costs in presenting my fantastic ontology of philosophy, it's the once upon a time, right? <laughs> He's basically implying, I'm telling you a fairy tale. <laughs> and I understand he, he's concerned here, Mr. Uh, you know, uh, Absolute Philosophy, right? A creation story. Oh, I'm going back into the Big Bang of the mind, right? And this is where he leaves in his imagined cloud castle balloon, right? And never comes back to reality, Mr. Bernardo, right? It, it, it's just sort of, it's just, magnitudes of of argumentative structure it's basically very small steps and then all of a sudden he takes off right goes into once upon a time <laughs> i mean i mean that statement in itself to me tells uh, you know volumes about his mentality right i would never Unless I'm creating some weirdo, sarcastic video of some kind, uh, and, and I would even then I would avoid it, right? Hopefully, saying something like "once upon a time," right? I mean, you have to be fucking crazy to say that in a presentation, in your the major presentation of your ontology philosophy. You wouldn't, for the fucking world. Choose to do that, right? Once upon a time. God damn, man, right? Was one <clears throat> universal mind, which I'm representing here as a circle. And of course, by definition, <coughs> there was no outside world. Because this mind is all that exists. There is nothing outside it. This one mind... But then... Of course, of course. Why? Oh my God, man. You're going back to some kind of uh, mental Big Bang or something. And there was only this, and because, there, and because there were only this, there wasn't something beyond it, obviously. But that's a imagined circular reasoning, man, right? And is this, okay, he has left every, every fucking direct experience behind. He's going into it, he's sitting in his mental cloud castle now, now, and he can come up with what? Ever the fuck he wants to be there, right? Because he has cherry picked the base core mind. He said that in his pres his defense of his uh, PhD thesis, which is actually the the uh, the consciousness only ontology, right? Thereby also equivocating the term uh, consciousness and mind, which is uh, problematic in my opinion, right? So there's, it is mindfuckery, this, right? I have no trust in this at all, right? It, this is never going to fly, right? If this is going to fly, I mean, I feel sorry for the coming generations, right? Because this is fucking madness. And underwent dissociation. Now, what is dissociation? Extreme forms of dissociation used to be called multiple personality disorder. And that's when different segments of what is fundamentally one and the same mind seemingly break apart, such that one segment has some of the memories, another alter has other memories, and they don't access each other's memories. Dissociation entails a dissociative boundary, the limit uh, of the dissociated ideas and emotions. So from within the boundary, ideas and emotions from the outside cannot go in, and the other way around is also not possible. The ideas and emotions, the transpersonal mental states, these ideas and emotions impinge on the dissociative boundary, and then nature has developed a way to leverage this impingement. <laughs> Evolution has found a way to zero in on that subtle impingement and amplify it and display it to us at a glance on the screen of perception. 
And the result of that is we see the world. We see the clouds. We see the sky. We see a fence and we see plants and the rest of the world. This is the instrument panel. It's what appears on this the instrument. Is, um, this is complete nonsense, right? He is placed, he is still a physicalist here. He's violating his own thinking. That world he's talking about here is on the inside of that, according to his stand, I'm not saying this is my philosophy, but according to his philosophy, your dashboard must be in there, in your dissociation. It can't be out there. So why are you play, placing the sky and the clouds and the, uh, you know, the, what, what they call, uh, they're called Velmu in, in Danish, right? Um, these uh, things you can smoke and can hide, right? Um, and the grassy fields and so on, it must be in there. But he places it out there, that idiot man, right? How, how can you go this wrong? How can you make a presentation this fucking stupid? He's basically saying, yeah, yeah, I reject physicalism. Now I'm going to make a presentation of my idealist, but I'm going to make it in a physicalist fashion. He's saying his experiences are out there, right? It's right there, man, right? <laughs> oh, man, fucking moron, man, right? And I hope that absolute philosophy is going to, you know, point that out. ...panel on the dashboard of dials. So human minds, according to Kastrup, are dissociated alters of universal consciousness. Reality has what we used to call multiple person. He has invented because he needs, in order to not be a solipsist, if he doesn't bring in DID or dissoci dissociative identity disorder, it's an annoying term, right? DID, if he doesn't bring in DID, he is a solipsist, right? And then he should shut the fuck up about his fancy philosophy, right? Because then he would be talking to his own experiences, right? So in order to not do that, because he needs to tell the world, the big world out there about his fantastic philosophy, he needs to create some kind of external world. Therefore, he brings in dissociate DID, right? It is purely in order to avoid solipsism, right? personality disorder and we are one of reality's personalities our minds according to Kastrup exist within a boundary which is itself within universal consciousness and the physical world is what universal consciousness looks so it's just a very very uh, imaginary abstract kind of idea of Mind here and mind there, but there's still a border between these two minds, right? Or aspects of the same mind. How how would you take water and water and keep them separated without having some other stuff, right? Bringing in some secondary stuff, right? How would you keep water and water separated, right? Is, and then he goes, yeah, 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 but that's just your experience of it. You can't get to that outside. But then you can't tell me about a borderline if you can't access that border. So he's he's wrapped up in these abstractions that is he is he is fabulating. The best way maybe to see it is it's an abstraction upon an abstraction upon an abstraction, and that is invalid thinking. You can only go from your direct experience into one abstraction. And when you've done that one abstraction, you can't go further in that direction because then you would abstract something on top of another abstraction or imagination, whatever you want to call it. You can't do that. You can't put... but Because then it's turtles all the way with another imagination and another imagination and imagination imagination. You can come up with whatever you want, right? You, you are allowed one abstraction, one imagination, and that's it, right? You are allowed to imagine an external world, but that's it. You can't go and imagine what the hell it's made of, in my opinion, right? Looks like, from our perspective, I think Castro presents quite an interesting idea here, but it's only one part of what we need to know to understand analytic idealism. 
The next part is that there are two different kinds of consciousness. <clears throat> what we call phenomenal consciousness in analytic philosophy, it has a formal definition, can be defined as such. A state in which there is something, anything, it is like to be. Now, there is another term uh, that uh, is technically called metaconsciousness. It is the explicit awareness of a phenomenally conscious state. We are self-aware. We have what psychology calls metacognition. Speak for yourself, right? You have. You can't say I have, right? Unless you make a statement about an axiom, about how you think about another mind out there you don't have access to, according to your own standards, right? So why, how did it become a we, right? In other words, not only do we experience, we know that we experience. We explicitly recognize ourselves as a subjective entity that has experiences. And that's why we say, I have hunger, or I feel sad, as opposed to I am hunger and I am sadness. I think we can say with some confidence that uh. the universal consciousness outside highly evolved life forms is not metacognitive. I just wanted to make sure that you picked what he's saying up. According to Kastrup, there are two kinds of consciousness, phenomenal consciousness and metaconsciousness. And he says that we, as humans, are capable of both kinds of consciousness. We are both phenomenally conscious of the world around us, and we also have a higher form of consciousness, metaconsciousness. Higher? That sounds like it's more important, right? Um, I would like to call it the phenomena and the awareness of the phenomena. You're, you're not only having the phenomena, you can be aware of it in, a, in an abstract fashion. You can have abstractions about your understanding that having, having the... You can think about an elephant without experiencing an elephant, right? That's a kind of meta-consciousness in the, in the Bernardo Castro ver version, right? Or that's how I understand it, right? If you, you can sit here and think about it, you can think about colors and elephants and soft eyes and Eiffel Tower and science and all sorts of shit without it actually being a part of your... So these are abstractions inside you that you can juggle around in some other kind of mentality that is sort of disconnected from the everyday experience of pizzas and cars and tomatoes, right? That's metaconsciousness, because why, why are you doing this if you're not experiencing a pizza? Why would I sit and think about a pizza, right? Because it's a kind of... It's kind of disconnected from that everyday thing. And maybe that's one of the problems in philosophy, that people retract into this metaconscious state rather than taking care of their actual conscious state, right? To stay with the terms of Bernardo Castro, I would like to just call it an awareness of what is going on. That awareness might be rather complicated, that I can sit here and think and philosophize and all that. But ultimately, that is what it is. You're aware of what is going on. It's not just going on. There is some part of you that is actually reflecting on it being going on. And that's what he called metaconsciousness. I would argue that the reason why he calls this metaconscious is he needs to keep the term consciousness everywhere when he talks about something. Otherwise, he would appeal to dualism at least, right? So he calls it consciousness and metaconsciousness. And it's still some kind of consciousness. So he hasn't brought in another thing, right? That's why he does it this way, in my opinion. Okay, let and meta consciousness let, means that actually that let me stop here because we are closing in on the one hour mark, right? So um, let me just say that 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 there will be another part, and maybe there will be <laughs> more than another part, maybe two or three other parts. Well, let's see how far it'll go, and um, beyond that, have a nice day. See you in the next one.